Good afternoon. What if I told you that there is a way that Citibank could capture customer transactional data every single time that city customers made a purchase, even if they didn't use their city cards? What if I told you that this could happen even if the transaction was made in cash? My name is Abigail and I'm here with my colleagues today, Jaya, Nick, and Rachel, and we are so excited to present to you our solution to this question that I have just posed to you. But before we do that, I want to start with more of an overview of, of City Hong Kong's current state as we see it. Um, the number one thing that we see is this movement or this pivot towards growth in terms of the digital sphere. And we've seen this happen in a couple of key focus areas. The first is becoming a mobile first bank. Um, the second is growing and fostering a digitally savvy customer base, more so than that of the general Hong Kong population. And then the third is this emphasis on fintech and the partnership with the, the fintech challenge and other strategic external partnerships um, to really see this growth within the digital sphere. So the logical next step becomes not just further integration as a player, but more as the leading banking institution within the fintech and technological ecosystem. But the question is, how does this happen? Well, this becomes a reality when we have predictive capabilities or more clearly defined data-driven insights on a complete and thorough customer snapshot that allows us to predict future customer and consumer wants and behaviors. But there are a couple of barriers that City faces in getting the data necessary to do this. The first is in terms of customer spending. Um, so more specifically, that customer spending is stratified. And we see this issue of customers using cards that are not city cards across multiple financial institutions. When this happens, it's difficult to collect this data and even more difficult to drive insight because it's only a part of the entire story. The second piece is that 40% of everyday transactions are in cash. Cash is very hard to track and even more difficult to understand because, again, it's only a piece of the puzzle. And because of this, we don't have a total idea of what the consumer profile is, which makes the predictive analytics very difficult to accomplish. So what is the solution? We're here today to talk to you about City Stamp, which is a brand new technology within the fintech ecosystem that collects aggregate consumer receipt data both online and in store. To explain to you a little bit more about what this looks like and how it works, as well as the interaction that it has with the consumer, more specifically in terms of adding value and building off of city current infrastructure, I'm going to hand it to my colleague, Nick. Thank you, Abby. So to understand this solution, we first need to talk about how the customer makes a purchase currently. Because when they do, they have several options in terms of payment. At a high level, they can pay with cash, check or with uh, credit cards. And even within that, when they're using checks and credit cards, it doesn't have to be their city issued ones, which is an issue because the only case in which city immediately gets that transactional insight is if they use the city cards. In every other case, that data is either delayed in the case of a city check or it's not captured at all, which is an issue because as Jaya points out, it doesn't give city the complete customer snapshot. So to understand our recommendation, I'm going to introduce you to a few key components of it. The first is this idea of a city stamp. And what that is at its core is a way to identify customers and a way to link that customer identity to the transaction that they're making. The city rece uh, receivers are the technology that enables this to happen by accepting, the, uh, by accepting the, the identity from the stamp and linking it to the transaction. And these, uh, this, the city stamp in store uses an embedded RFID chip and a token or uses NFC technology through the customer's smartphone to identify that customer. And a reader located at the point of sale will accept that identity, link it to the transaction, and send it to city. So let's take a look at how this works in actuality. So if we're in-store purchases, a customer uh, you know, pays cash, pays uh, with another card that's not city's at a, at a cashier. But instead of asking for a printed or an emailed receipt, they opt for city stamp in which they will tap their smartphone or tap their token to the receiver, linking their transaction. What this does is the receiver pulls the transaction data from the point of sale and pulls the customer in, uh, identity from the token. And in doing so, sends the combined data to Citi. And this is important because if we think about the data points that are coming from each of these, uh, each of these points, uh, we see that you know, the item and the amount come from the point of sale while the identity comes from the token. And on their own, both of the, all of these data points are not of much value to Citi. But combined, they allow City to understand customer purchasing habits, and they allow City to do that regardless 
of what the customer is using uh, to, uh, to make the payment. And this process is similar online. So instead of a physical token that the customer is using, they have a city stamp pin that's linked with the, uh, it's linked into the payment platform that identifies the customer. The transaction and the customer data are both pulled by the receiver and sent to City. So in essence, what City Stamp is doing is it's changing the way people get receipts and it's changing the way City gets data. And it's doing so in a way that adds value to the customer experience, that helps City complete the customer snapshot and that aligns with the existing infrastructure. First, we'd like to talk a little bit about how uh, this will add value to the customer experience. So we've identified a few key benefits that this will bring and why that's, we consider that to be value add for the, uh, for the customer. So the first is the added convenience. The customer no longer has to keep track of physical receipts. They no longer have to take the, uh, the physical receipt from the merchant, put it into their wallet, figure out what to do with it when they get home. Now it's all centrally uh, allocated into their city uh, ecosystem. And we know that this is value add because over 90% of customers would prefer to receive digital receipts, but only 35% of merchants will provide it. And this city stamp is an innovation above digital because it doesn't require the customer to search through their email, to search through their electronic records to their receipts. They're all stored in a central location, regardless of what payment method they've been using. Second, this centralizes budgeting, which is the natural result of this first benefit. And we know that over 40% of customers are dissatisfied with their budgeting habits. And one of the main reasons for that is that it's difficult to log your expenses, to remember the purchases that you've been making, and to stick to a plan whereby you do this manually. But if City is able to pull all of that data for you and put it in one spot for you, then it becomes much easier to plan your budgeting. And this is a big uh, value add to the consumer experience. And lastly, it provides peace of mind. Cybersecurity is top of mind for everyone today, and that includes these consumers. Because the City stamp acts as a form of two-step authentication. Only the customer has access to the token and can actually make the transaction, or can actually link the transaction with their identity. I have a question for you. Um, is this uh, value add that you just explained future compatible or not? Because what I know about the youngsters and the second generations, they don't care how much they spend. So <laughs> needless to say, they don't need receipts. They don't want to count you know, how much they have spent in cash or in credit card. So will this value add that you just explained probably very suitable for me mm -hmm. you know, because I want to take everything you know, in record, but how about for the future generations and the uh, youngsters like yourselves. Absolutely, uh, because the future generation has different purchasing habits and we need to understand and we need to create a solution that targets them as well as targets our customer demographic, which I'll touch on a little bit later. You know, and so for this new consumer, what we find is that they're, very, is that they're more digitally savvy, is that they're more inclined to use these types of online payments, uh, you know, these smartphone enabled technologies. And so I think what you'll see is that the new consumer, this new consumer, this younger consumer, is more inclined to be to use the smartphone technology as opposed to fumble around with the manual receipts. Whereas their parents uh, might have taken the physical receipts, manually tallied them up, kept them, you know, in a book, or you know, uh, you know, just kind of done that whole process manually in the past. This new consumer sees the convenience of the electronic aggregation of receipt data. So I think that this solution is one that in fact targets uh, that con that customer. Another question I have is, you know, this seems uh, a very easily uh, copy solution, you know, by other banks. Mm -hmm. So if HSBC, Standard Charter all do the same thing, you know, what's the net for the customer to do it for City, and how valuable the data becomes to me? Right. So we, you know, the one of the key components of a competitive advantage, especially when implementing an initiative like this, is that it isn't easily imitatable by other competitors. So, you know, towards this end, City has a number of competitive advantages and infrastructure within its own banking process that lend itself well uh, to something like this and that make it difficult for others to copy. One of those is City's emphasis on being, as Abby, as Abby mentioned, a mobile first bank. So the infrastructure within City is already geared, uh, to, you know, to begin implementing digital solutions, to begin partnering with fintech firms that we will discuss later that will help City Bank uh, as, they go through, uh, as they go through implementing this process. Uh, so, you know, I think that what you'll see with HSBC and a lot of these other uh, companies is that they simply, they can't move as fast as City because, sim uh, because you know, through City's many fintech uh, initiatives and ventures, they have the agility of a much smaller firm with the institutional support and capabilities of a much larger firm. And that's a competitive advantage that lends itself well to digital solutions like this. Um, are you suggesting that CD should be spending on all these capital expenses on, you know, Installing all the devices at the POS and stuff like that, or we should partner with you know some other service provider. 
Right, and you know, for the financial questions of how this is going to uh, look, I'll hand it off to my uh, colleague Jaya, who can just briefly touch on uh, you know exactly what that what that financial impact looks like. Sure, this is a topic we're also going to discuss a little bit later. But to give you a quick overview, we're estimating that for the startup costs, it's going to be around forty-one million Hong Kong dollars, and for the yearly costs, starting in year one onwards, it should be about fifteen million Hong Kong dollars. We're estimating this as a combination of a push for the actual devices that will be sent to vendors, as well as having marketing and education initiatives for your customers so that they are able to use this technology. And specifically, we wanted to make sure we're targeting education initiatives for your more wealthy clients so that they are using it because they are driving most of your revenue, so you want to get their data first. I'll hand it back to Nick now. Thank you, Jay. Yep. And so as we wrap up the value add to the customer experience, we talk, we, you know, leap into cybersecurity, which is the fact that, you know, this serves as two-step authentication and the enhanced analytical ability will enable City to make better uh, predictions at detecting irregularities about be better understanding their customers' normal habits. And so now that we kind of understand why this is a value add to customers, we need to make sure this is also value add to City. So I'll hand it off to Rachel to go over this part of the plan. So to your question, Mr. Fung, as to kind of where the return is coming from, we believe that this will enable City as a bank to achieve extreme uh, customer analytics by collecting the data, which is the key to this puzzle. We know from various case studies that data analytics within the finance space is extremely powerful and profound in terms of the diversity of application. So just to call out one of the case studies on the screen, we'll see at the very bottom that just this past year, a large Asian consumer bank was able to combine customer demographic data with transaction purchase data to be able to increase the purchase intent of the targeted products by about three times. So we understand that the implications of this are profound and diverse. But in order to achieve these returns, the critical step is to be able to collect the data to create these analytics. And this is exactly what a program like City Stamp allows City to do. What you'll see on the right-hand side of the screen is our projections for the amount of data that City will be able to capture along customer transactions. So the way that you read this graph is along the bottom line, you'll see our projections for market adoption rate based on your current City customer base. And then the size of the bars will tell you the percent increase in the data that's currently being captured in 2016. So just to call out one example, in 2020, we are assuming a market adoption rate of 20%, and we see that this will drive an increase in data captured specifically along the lines of transactions by about 50%. More importantly, this data capture is a significant amount, but it also is within a space that is cash-based. So you're able to get a complete customer snapshot, not just along the lines of the credits and the debit cards that are being spent, but within cash transactions, which is something that was previously untapped. So we've talked about the value add to the customer, and we've talked about the value add to you as a firm. Lastly, we'd love to discuss how exactly this is feasible in terms of if existing infrastructure is there. Sorry, let me interrupt. Um, so yeah, I, I got more data from customers, so what do I do with it? Absolutely. So there are various um, kind of implications and ways to apply the data. So we see this being in the space of understanding at-risk customers. For example, we'll see on this slide um, various instances where banks have been able to apply the data. So the first example is increasing revenue for a US bank. What they did is they looked at the efficacy of discounts, and they were able to see if the discounts were working or not. And I think you can pull that out of transaction data by cross-referencing the discount with the transaction that occurred. The second example is a 12% gain just overall for banks that use analytics. But then the third Third example shows a European bank where they were able to combine transaction data with understanding kind of what treatment was used for the customer and understand the customers that were at risk for the bank and reduced churn. So those are just three high level examples of how data has been applied. But the key for our discussion today is to first understand how to get the data and that's where City Stamps value add is. You are all talking about increasing <coughs> business from the existing customer base. Uh, have you looked at how about new customer base? Absolutely. So we believe that this will provide a snapshot of existing customers. We believe a secondary benefit is as an attractive factor for new customers. So we'll use this strategy to primarily increase share of wallet, but then we do believe that by adding value to the customer experience, as Nick talked about earlier, this will be a driving factor to converting customers and stealing share from competitors as well. Um, so, oops, sorry. Good. You're fine. <laughs> you have... Um, Describe the value proposition for customer in terms of the solutions that you mentioned, right? But in your solution, it also required um, some support from other partners or other vendors, right? So what, what are the value propositions that um, 
this solution will, will be providing to the vendors or to the partners so that they will be engaging in this um, uh, solution. Absolutely, and I'll actually pass it off to my colleague Nick. He'll talk about this later on in the presentation as well, but just a high level. Yes, thank you, Rachel. So to under, you know, we've talked about customer buy-in. We've talked about why it's valuable for city. And the natural next question you're right is vendor buy-in. And we've come up with a few strategies you know, that we'll talk about later, but I'd love to give a high-level overview now. Uh, you know, so one of those is the fact that this data is valuable to city. It's also valuable to vendors. So establishing partnerships with these vendors, sharing the kinds of data and insights that city has generated so that the vendors also see value in this. Uh, beyond that, we've also discussed you know, how this might increase customer satisfaction for a vendor for the fact that, one, the vendor no longer has to you know, collect its own receipts and you know, tally up its own uh, merchandise. The city stamp will be an effective tool for digitizing their records. It'll also increase customer satisfaction as the customers no longer have to go through this process either. And lastly, we've also included a financial incentive for vendors, which will be a 0.01% uh, fee uh, or a bonus, excuse me, to the vendors for each transaction made on the uh, city stamp software. So ultimately, between the financial incentive, between the incentive of making their processes and their customers have a more convenient experience, and between the you know, data sharing that is shared with the vendor, we think it's also a very exciting proposition for vendors to participate in this process. And to talk through, sorry, yep, go ahead. Um, you you have mentioned about the benefits to the vendors, right? But what are the investment that you expect the vendors will need to, you know, put into this solution or making it happen? Absolutely. So that is something we discussed. Since it is a new technology and we are requiring effort on the vendor to change their process, we expect them actually to invest zero dollars at the start. So as um, factored into our cost analysis, uh, we believe that city can actually pay for the development of these machines and technology, as well as pay for the shipping to the vendor and allow their ease of implementation to be as seamless as possible. And so that's one of the key drivers of adoption on the vendor side, actually, which will create this ecosystem for uh, customers to be able to use. So this um, kind of infrastructure related questions. Uh, we talk about the sharing of the data to the retailers or, or the partners, but at the same time, we also talk about the data privacy, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, if you are sharing the kind of complete picture of the data set to the retailer, then we kind of hit the data policy um, privacy issue. But at the mm -hmm. same time, if you don't share, the retailer already have those transaction data with them. So where's the publishing for them? Absolutely, and one thing that we definitely took a hard look at while we were thinking about all of these different solutions were the regulations that are currently in place, whether endorsed by the HKMA or through the banking ordinance um, or other codes and, and policies and procedures. And one thing that we found was that there were eight very specific regulations laid out um, whenever three parties were involved in a transaction of any kind. Um, and one of the main principles that we looked at was the third principle, which is transparency with vendors. Um, and there are establishing limitations with what data is shared is absolutely essential. So once the data starts coming in and really understanding what those limitations are is absolutely critical to finding that balance, but it is absolutely possible to share certain insights with vendors, um, although of course it will not be the full strength of the application possible, um, which is absolutely acceptable in this term. But finding that limit is something that is at the forefront of our mind and it is allowable under the HKMA policy. Um, so we have looked at that and we have considered that and we feel very confident um, that that balance is something that can be found and that can also bring value to the vendor. So where I think a lot of the questions are going is if this is a feasible idea and how exactly we're going to roll it out to get buy-in from all stakeholders. Just to speak briefly to where this aligns with existing infrastructure, our last rationale for understanding the idea of city stamp is that some of the infrastructure and ease of implementation already exists. We know that for City Hong Kong, your customers are already more digitally and mobilely engaged than the rest of the Hong Kong consumer base. We know from a city standpoint that you're known across the region as a strong consumer bank within a digital space and you've been able to roll out various fintech innovations quite successfully over the past few years. And lastly, to speak briefly into the vendor point and then transition more into implementation, we know that the technology, which is these electronic terminals where you would trip to traditionally use a card, exists in order to support a recommendation like City Stamp. So every three and four vendors owns the terminal, and this is actually expected to grow by a kicker of about 3% over the next three years. So we know that a program such as City Stamp adds value to the customer. It adds value to you as a firm, and it creates synergies with existing infrastructure in the Hong Kong market. Now I'll pass it off to my colleague Jaya to discuss what exactly the impacts and the next steps look like. 
Thanks, Rachel. When starting with implementation, we wanted to start by writing, finding the right fintech firm to be your partner. So what that meant was looking through these key criterion and picking a firm through the process of an open AI that would be able to both financially and feasibly well with this project. So what a few firms we were interested in looking at were those as listed here. But really the key is that finding the right partnership and the right firm is going to allow you to achieve both the cost and re revenue goals that we've set in place. We talked a little bit about costs earlier and how we estimated costs for the first year to be 41 million Hong Kong dollars and for years after that to be 15 million Hong Kong dollars. Breaking down some of those costs, we found that most of the costs are actually going to be going to the consumer and vendor side. When we talk about that, what we mean is that the cost for the consumer side what we're going to want to build upon is making sure that your customers both know about the product and they're educated in how to use it, and that the vendors have the ability to implement this easily, as Nick and Rachel mentioned earlier. The heavy costs associated with the, rep with the vendors is going to be the chip that we're going to be giving them, as well as marketing to them. So forget about the vendors' uh, investment for a moment. I just look at the 41 million that I have to put in. I'm a bit uh, sweaty and scary. Um, <laughs> so. I have a question, you know, as e-commerce, you know, developed more and more, you know, people tend to move their habit or change their habit, you know, to purchase online. Do you think that, you know, this will gradually make your value proposition extinct? Sure. I'll hand this off to Nick. No, thank you for that question because it's really important to take into account purchasing habits. You know, we talked earlier about what it's going to look like when younger consumers adopt this technology. So we have to understand what it's going to look like when, you know, the, the, a lot of the purchasing moves to online. And this absolutely is an in-store and an online solution. And, you know, maybe, uh, you know, we glossed a little bit over the online implementation earlier. Uh, but, you know, to, to walk through this, it's, um, it's basically going to, you know, think of this as uh, linking the city stamp pin with the online payment platform. Uh, and so if you move a little bit into uh, the implementation side of things, uh, you know, we talk about how online how online vendors are going to work. So, you know, currently Citi has partnerships with WeChat Pay and with Alipay. So, you know, using these partnerships, leveraging these partnerships, we can, uh, Citi can incorporate the Citi Stamp Pin concept into these. So, when a customer links their Citi Stamp Pin to an online retailer, that can push their transactions that they make on that retailer, regardless of their payment method, to Citi. And so that, rely, that leverages Citi's, uh, you know, Citi's status as a large international institution that's able to maintain very successful relationships like this. And it's also a reason this idea is very scalable as it moves to other regions that you use other different types of payment platforms, is that Citi has a touch in all these. So you know, what this comes down to is that online, it's just as easy, if not easier, for the customer to begin aggregating the receipts. Uh, and that you know, it, it, we have to think about, too, not only where the industry is going, which is this online solution, but also where the industry is now, because that's how you establish your first move of advantage, your competitive advantages. So thinking about how 40% of transactions are in cash, we can, this solution captures where the market is now, and with the online implementation, it captures where it's going. Maybe, maybe I'm not very clear about you know, how exactly it works, because you know, if I purchase only you know, via Alipay, say, for example, you know, mm -hmm. e-commerce, I buy everything you know, from, from Taobao, um, they already aggregate my receipts, you know, because I only buy from through the, it's like a broker, it's like an aggregator already, right? Mm -hmm. So why, why do I need to do another level of aggregations in terms of payment? Uh, yeah, and you know, when we talk about advantages to, uh, to vendors, um, we're looking at, you know, pretty much the same incentives uh, to them. And, you know, while the financial incentives and the uh, data sharing incentives might be diluted in terms of an online vendor, the customer satisfaction that they're seeing is greater. And the fact that they have a relationship that they want to maintain with Citi adds bargaining power to Citi's position uh, so that it's something they want to implement. And we also just have to think about how simple and feasible it would be uh, for a pro uh, program like this. So if we take a look at how a customer uh, might go about this process, it would be, you know, think about how you might link your rewards program you know, with another, with another site, where the sites try to have partnerships between different rewards programs. It would be as easy as inputting your city stamp PIN into this online payment platform once, and that registers the customer as a city account holder. So the, the actual implementation of this uh, is simple, and the benefits are clear as we have, as those partnerships already exist. So, you know, now that we understand a little bit of how the, you know, how this process gets implemented from a vendor perspective, from a customer perspective, what they look at. Uh, you know, now I think it's important that, um, Eric, it's important now that we talk about 
you know, how this might, how this implementation rollout will actually look like. So I'll hand it off to uh, Abby to discuss, uh, you know, kind of our timeline for implementation. Thank you, Nick. So when we think about any sort of technology solution, the key is speed and efficiency. Because as you mentioned, the landscape changes constantly. So what we see is three main areas of focus. The first being R&D, of course, is extremely important. And this is where we see the integration into the FinTech ecosystem by working with a partner, somewhat like what Jaya mentioned earlier, looking at those key criteria to determine who is going to be the best fit to help us drive insights. Um, of course, the second part after R&D is the actual launch and the rollout. We see a beta program starting at the beginning of the fifth month with three months to evaluate, analyze, and collect data with the rollout to certain Hong Kong vendors at the beginning of the eighth month. So this is contained within an eight month start. Um, and then going forward, it's not just the timeline that we wanted to look at, but also specific risks. As there are risks with any sort of solution, especially in the technology space, we looked at a couple key areas, including competition um, and cybersecurity, and we developed mitigation strategies for those so that there's a very concrete way to address some of these going forward. Um, but not, we didn't just consider the actual technology. Um, any technology implementation is going to have wide scale impacts across the entire value chain of banking, and that's what we wanted to consider and really pull from. So when we were doing our research, as I briefly touched on um, policies by the HK May and the banking ordinance earlier, of, co of course those are areas that we deeply considered. And that's what we put into our regulatory bucket. So we considered all of the regulatory limitations that we focused on. And that was um, in part how we understood how to communicate with vendors, for example. Um, but then on the other side was internally, within city. What does that look like across multiple departments? Well, of course, research and advisory is going to have a huge impact. We're going to see relationships strengthen then between customers and CRMs as they are better able to understand and predict what their customers are going to want because this data is helping us build predictive analytics. And then of course other areas such as operations and technology are going to feel this as this is the main primary partnership point with any sort of fintech solution. Um, so as we understand and we can see the impacts that just go across the entire value chain, we want to make sure that we brought that um, up as well and discuss that because we do understand the connotations. So moving forward to wrap us up, I'm going to hand it to Nick um, so that he can briefly do an overview and then we can answer any additional questions as well. Just one more first. Um, so totally agree on the overall impact of the org uh, organization, but at the same time, so how can we do it like by a kind of chunkable size to start with? Or what is the pilot things? How you determine the pilot as a success before we really roll it out? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, so when you're assessing the success of a piece of technology during a beta implementation program, there's a couple key success metrics that we want to look at. Um, the first is customer adoption. Um, so we have a very particular KPIs that we looked at, um, and one of those is customer satisfaction and customer adoption. Um, we want to see customer adoption within that beta at 60%, as that is industry standard. Um, and we expect that to grow. Um, the other thing is in terms of customer satisfaction, that's a lot of qualitative data that comes in in terms of reviews, face-to-face -face interviews with CRMs and contact with their um, customers and under in evaluating those two pieces um, and then finally we also want to evaluate and start in, in terms of where we start of course we start with satisfaction and we start with adoption and then the third place that we look at is really making sure and this these can all happen simultaneously um, is looking at the financial impact and making sure that we are on budget and on time because of course those are the two areas that we want to make sure that any technological program is following those those two trends that they are on time and on budget so those are the first three places that we would start So far, you are focusing on existing customer base, <coughs> or mostly on existing customer base. Uh, have you looked at what would be the minimum size of the customers for you to uh, spend so much money on it to be profitable? Absolutely, and I'll hand it to my colleague Jaya to talk to you briefly about that. So when we were looking at how this would be profitable, we did a break-even analysis based on current profit and current number of customers and saw that for you to be profitable, if you didn't add any new customers, you would need to increase wallet share per customer 0.018%. So it's very feasible, especially when considering the case studies that Rachel had previously mentioned in attaining this feasible goal for you to break even and then hopefully become profitable afterwards. Thank you, Jay. And of course, the key thing to always remember is that this is not just a financial play. This is a growth play. This is a strategic play. You know, a wise Chinese proverb says that you cannot stand at the river and yearn for fish. You must go home and make a net. City in a digital era cannot afford to stand by the water and let data pass it by. 
it has to weave the net with city stand to capture that data to better understand its customers to gain an edge in the market thank you so much we had a wonderful time discussing the solution with you today